Hello gamers and welcome back to another episode of the Monthly Meadow where we go ahead and talk about the most popular decks in Hearthstone. Uh, for those of you who are new, I'm Warshack or Rob, whichever one you want to call me. And um, this video is going to be covering, like I said, the most popular decks in Hearthstone as of now. Um, I release this video at the beginning of every month, which means later and later in the month, um, the video becomes more and more outdated. So just keep in mind the publish date and the release date of this video to when you're uh, watching it because I know um, towards the end of the month and uh, the follow-up month things can change and decks may alter so with that said for those of you again who are unfamiliar with how we do our monthly meta um, I go ahead and we talk about each individual class the decks that fall under those classes and um, a little bit about the deck what makes it so powerful what makes it kind of the oomph of that particular archetype at this particular time um, as we know things will change um, so just keep that in mind. Um, I'll talk about anything that kind of sticks out uh, about the deck right now because I know um, it's very weird the meta. It's very rock paper scissors right now and the matchups and things are fluctuating pretty I don't, I don't want to say rapidly um, but Reno Mage a month or two ago is not the same Reno Mage today. Same thing with Rogue and Pirate Warrior. So I'm going to kind of elaborate on those decks a little bit further than normal. Um, so with that said let's head into it. I believe our first uh, deck we're going to or the first, first class we're going to talk about is going to be the druid and that's going to be the ramp druid so this is um not the coon combo um this is the ramp druid or some call it the malagos um otk druid um it kind of revolves around and has the same game plan um as the otk cthune druid which we will cover uh shortly after this but the game plan of this particular one it kind of is a mix it has like um, the same elements of the Malagos Druid we saw before Mean Streets, and it also has the part of um, Aviana and Kuhn to be able to get that explosive kind of one-turn OTK, draw a bunch of cards, deal a bunch of damage. And um, the setup in this game is ramp, ramp, ramp through Wild Growth, Raven Idling, uh, Nourish, um, of course your Meyer Keepers. You're heading into cards like Ancient of War and Gadgetson to be able to cycle, more so Gadgetson towards when you pull off the combo, but you can still use Gadgetson um, otherwise that's why i've included two of them in the deck also guys keep in mind that the deck lists on the side are my personal deck lists um they're not any particular you know this is the, exactly what you need to play um these are the decks that i'm playing with currently if i were to play this particular deck so if you don't like something you're more than welcome to take it out and if you disagree with me go ahead and change those cards you do not have to copy these card for card and then argue with me because you don't like it <laughs> um the core of it is kind of what I want to get to you guys. The core of every deck is what makes it that particular kind of archetype, or I should say kind of deck. Um, so the double auctioneer is kind of a tech in. Normally you could run two wars, one auctioneer, but I've chosen to run two because I found that cycling is basically the most important uh, part of this deck due to the fact that you want to put all the pieces together and to get the combo off which is of course having the Avion and the Malagos, the Coon, and then of course your gadgets and auctioneer to be able to... Um, so. I guess I'll start with the combo for those of you who are unfamiliar. So you play um, Aviana, and she says that all your minions cost one. Then you play Kuhn, which says refresh all of your mana crystals or gain seven ar or ten armor. You don't want the ten armor. You want to gain mana crystals. From there, you've played a five five that makes all creatures a one one. A Kuhn that's going to refresh all your mana creature creature uh, crystals. That's already a seven seven. And then you go ahead and like drop Malagos. You drop Auctioneers. Um, you draw a bunch with cards such as Living Ruth, Moonfire, because you have. Uh, uh, the gadgets in out and then you just go crazy on the board um, dealing a large quantity of damage with either Malagos because you've dropped him as well for one mana um, or you just fill up the board with giant creatures and your opponent can't get rid of it so lots of cool stuff you could do with this deck still has kind of the same OTK potential as the Cthune but it has more of the um the it also has cards of the old Malagos Druid which we it used to be a very powerful deck um, but now that Yogg has been nerfed I don't think that deck is as good anymore so moving over to the Kuhn version of the deck uh, or I should say Cthune uh, where we have basically you instead of using Malagos and um, Auctioneers we go ahead and we still do the same um, Aviana Coon combo, but instead we're gonna play like Bran and then we're gonna play a whole bunch of buffing creatures to Cthune because they get buffed and they double up because Battle Cry is triggered twice. Cthune, let's say, is a 20 20. Bran is out, he hits for 20 20 twice. That's a 40 damage combo right there. And then you could use uh, go ahead and youthful brewmaster Cthune back to your hand and then play him again for an additional 40 damage. So you have like 80 damage burst, you know, some casual 80 damage with this deck. Um, granted, you're not gonna pull off that combo every single time because it is you have to have quite a few cards to do it, but you'll actually 
perfectly fine that you're able to put the pieces together more times than not whether you're getting the full combo with Bran or you're just pandaing back Cthune for like 15 twice whatever the case may be most of the time you're going to be able to do probably 25 to 40 damage with the Cthune your Aviana and the Coon combo which is uh the core and the point of this deck if you had to choose between the Malagos and the Cthune version um, I would say probably the Malagos is a little bit more consistent um, but it all depends what you kind of going after in the deck and um, what you feel most comfortable playing uh, a lot of players will come to me and they'll uh, I guess that's kind of off the point but just go with what you're comfortable with and the deck that you actually like the most and you enjoy playing will probably have a higher win rate than a deck that you don't like <laughs> um, for the sometimes the next deck is going to be the jade golem druid probably the most popular druid deck on ladder um, the other two um, aren't as popular but they are druid decks that you will see and you probably need to know their win condition because you're gonna be like what are they doing all game they're not really playing anything all of a sudden they deal 60 damage to your face and you're like holy crap i had no idea <laughs> um, so the next one's a little bit more straightforward. It's a it's the Jade Golem core. So of course they're uh, the point of the Strew deck is to keep ramping. They're playing Jade Golems. They they have Jade Blossoms instead of Wild Growth. They keep summoning Jade Golems and eventually the Drew just outruns you with large quantities of Jade Golem cards. Whether it's from Aya Black Paw the behemoth bran into the jade spirit. It still has the same core cards with the Feral Raids, the Wrath, the Living Roots, the Jade Idols. And then also a key note that this deck has over other Jade Golem decks is the fact that you're going to be able to Gadgets and Auctioneer into the Jade Idol and put three more copies into your deck and then just basically keep drawing for a never-ending cycle of Jade Golems, um, which a lot of decks don't have because they don't have Jade Idol as a card. Um, this deck hasn't changed a lot since the release of Mean Streets and there's not much I can do about that. This is just, this is the same deck list that I pushed from rank I think 6 to rank 2 in like a couple hours on stream. So it's a really powerful deck, re really interesting in my opinion. It's fun um, and it's probably going to be the most popular druid you're going to encounter on ladder. So the next deck, or the class we're going to talk about is going to be Mage, and the first list is going to be the Reno Mage. Um, so this is a, Reno Mage has been, it's very interesting, because originally there was no Alexstrasza, there was no Archmage, um, people ran the Medivh instead, and you got a lot of value through his weapon. Um, it was unfavored versus Pirate Warrior, and um, it was unfavored versus the Reno Warlock, but over the time, players have been uh, more consistent with the deck, been playing it uh, more and more, and found that this deck actually performs very uh, very very well <laughs> against um both the pirate warrior and the uh warlock uh, reno warlock if you draw correctly and your deck is built accordingly so with that said the deck is uh hasn't changed a lot it's just the way players have been playing it um has changed so um whether you're gonna play you know the um the medieval instead of the archmage you're gonna throw in the burgly i think it's the five drop whenever your opponent casts a spell gain a coin which helps you kind of be able to get the um the archmage value in here i personally don't like that particular card um but you guys are, of course you can run that instead of the Cabalist home it's completely up to you um like i said tekken cards are kind of there uh, but the core of the deck is here basically to fatigue your opponent um, with the Reno Warlock when we cover that the, the deck necessarily is not trying to fatigue you and make you run out of steam it's got a lot of aggressive cards and it's got a lot of cards that can obtain board presence and it's very hard for your opponent to come back from that state uh, but the Reno Mage is very interesting because it just seems every turn your opponent just you you have it kind of exactly what you need for the situation at hand and then you're like all right what do i do and then you draw something and your opponent played something oh i can do this and every game is going to be different very cool very hard deck to play by the way this deck is extremely hard to navigate and play correctly sure you can play with the deck you can do well um but to master this deck and to play it you know 95 plus percent correctly every game um, is going to take a while so don't get your hopes down if the, the reno mage is costing you a lot of losses it's completely normal everybody's gonna suck with the deck once they start with it the next deck is going to be the tempo mage um, reno mage is probably i want to say 75 percent of the mage you're going to see and then the other 25 is most likely going to be some form of tempo mage which we'll see here um, the deck um, like any tempo deck is trying to 
pump out as many cards and get as most cheap value as possible so whether you're playing mana worm into arcane missiles to give it attack and then also be able to get the missiles down with the flame waker the forgotten torch put fireballs back in your deck um Ezer drake to keep the spell power rolling in the cycle there's just so much synergy in this deck between creatures and spells um that the early game is so very important for you to get a grasp on the board either deal large quantities of damage to your opponent's face or make sure they don't have creatures on the board chunk them down and by turn seven or eight you should be you know sitting pretty with one two maybe even three creatures on the board your opponent should have 12 or less hp and you can finish it off with a fireball frostbolt uh, firelands portal rag things of that nature um to keep the gas going in this deck because it is a tempo deck and they seem a lot of tempo decks seem to run out of steam um, you just can't seem to get the card draw in there so i've added cards like of course blood mage which synergizes well with a crane blast and all the other spells but more importantly arcane intellect um, cards like azur drake and the conjure is actually something very interesting um, a lot of players have taken out the conjure and added in maybe um, some more early game uh, but i've decided against it i like having conjures in the deck not only are they a five three or a six three which needs to be dealt with that turn because your opponent can't afford to take six damage to face it also generates you a spell based on the current situation you're in uh you're in uh which i find extremely helpful a lot of the time so whether you need another fireball frostbolt ice lance flame strike most of the time you're gonna get something pretty decent that you're gonna need in that particular situation so i found the tempo mage to be quite strong right now um whether or not it's this exact build or not this is what i've been playing and it's been fairly successful for me uh, moving on to paladin yes paladin has made it to a most popular deck list on this month's monthly meta uh, it's been absent for quite some time and murloc paladin has made its way back gaining popularity uh, by our buddy thice or this hopefully i'm saying his name right he had played it uh, along with his team in a recent tournament. Uh, he went 6-0 <laughs> against another particular pro team. And then on top of that, they continued to do well with it over the course of the tournament. And because of that, the casters were talking about it. It was all over Reddit. Um, how Paladin has kind of finally made some form of comeback. Um, people didn't think Ninja was gonna, F Finja was going to be that great. But turns out Finja is actually really, 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 really good in this deck. And can definitely win you games on his own. So with that said, the Murloc Paladin is back. For those of you unfamiliar with Murloc Paladin, because... You're either just now getting a Hearthstone or you don't seem to remember what happened back in the day. Uh, but you look at this deck and you go, well, if you're running Murloc Paladin, why don't you have the... Uh, what is it called? It's the Murloc Knight, the four drop hero power, uh, summon a Murloc. The reason being is you're using anything can happen, which is your 10 mana summon all the Murlocs that have died this game on your side of the field, I believe, is what they changed it to, um, is to be able to one turn kill your opponent with cards such as the Murloc War Leader, which buffs the other Murlocs, and then the other Murlocs being the Bluegill Warriors, which have charge. So essentially, you're summoning a whole board of Murlocs that can attack as soon as they come out with cards like War Leader that buff the Murlocs that can't attack right away. And and most of the time you're going to be able to deal over 25 if not 30 damage in a single turn um, which allows you to otk your opponent once hit uh, once you make it to the later stages in the game there's cards like Tyrion, ragnaros and ivory knight to be able to sustain you during the mid to late game whether it's healing you or defending you uh, you've got cards in the early game such as the alkalite of pain wild pyromancer equality doomsayer forbidden healing consecration to be able to survive the early to mid game and then you've got cards of course like true silver champion and solemn vigil in the mid game to either kill creatures and or to draw so overall very cool deck the only problem is it's extremely weak to aggro paladin aggro warrior or any sort of very early game based deck because if you end up drawing any of your late game and don't draw your early game you lose if you draw you know too much of your early game and can't seem to get the heal you lose um so and what makes this deck so powerful in tournaments is that you can ban um warrior and shaman so you don't have to go against those classes or rogue um and you can play this against other control decks such as the druids and the um priests and warlocks and um it can actually get the ball rolling half the time and actually be able to survive past turn four or five <laughs> which um rogue warrior and shaman seems to be able to kill your opponent before then so um in tournaments it's really good on ladder a lot of people are playing it you should definitely know what you're going against not the buff paladin it's going to be probably the murloc paladin so looking at priest we have the reno dragon priest um again this is a very similar list to last month. The deck really hasn't changed that much. A lot of people are going in between playing dragons or just playing normal, like, control or, like, death rattly priest with 
of course reno and kazakis in there um but i found the dragon variation for me to be the most popular so with that said um it's not like you can just basically look back to last month and see what I said. Um, in my opinion, it's not one of the strongest or consistent decks, but a lot of people still are playing it. It's fun and there's a lot of options, but if I were to play a Reno deck, it would have to be most likely the uh, Mage or the Warlock. I would not so much recommend the Priest uh, Reno, but I would, however, recommend the Dragon Priest, <laughs> which is a very powerful deck that everybody's playing if you're playing Priest for the most part. The deck thrives off being able to have a very strong early game with Twilight Whelps and the Agents, which basically stop aggro in their tracks. Your mid game, if you can summon an early game creature, consists of Talon Priest, which buffs a creature currently out by 3 HP, which is huge. Plus, he's already statted at 3 4 himself. You've got cards like Twilight Guardian and Blackwing Corruptor in your mid game. You've got Operative Holy Nova um, for a little bit later in the mid game. Uh, this, again, is my particular build. I'm running two Holy Novas, two Dragonfires, and two Entombs. This is what I found to do very well for me um whether you only want to run one dragon fire and no entombs or no ysero two entombs one dragon but whatever you want to do doesn't matter the core of the deck is dragon priest and that's what's here what makes this deck ever so strong right now is the card the operative the drag the dragon operative dragonoid operative and that's to discover a card in your opponent's deck. It combos with Bran. You can get this off Nether Spy Historian. It's a five drop, five six. Counts as a dragon himself. And the card, this this card solely just carries this deck to victory. Whether you're playing against a mid range or a control deck, um, again, you still can get blown out by a aggro deck if you draw very slow with this deck. Um, but this deck, again, if you draw correctly, can put up quite a fight uh, versus most aggro decks. So the next deck or the most next class we're going to talk about is going to be rogue and that's going to be the standard miracle rogue list. The deck at the beginning of the game has the pirate package, which makes it very, very strong with using most of the time rogue is going to hero power on turn two anyway, which makes um, getting the small time buccaneer with patches the pirate on turn one even more powerful because most of the time your opponent can't deal with a one, two and a one, one turn two is hero power. They deal huge amounts of damage, whether they're bringing out a giant Van Cleef um, or they're just, you know, playing Tomb Pillager as Erdrake into a gadgets in turn with conceal. This deck has a lot of opportunity to do a lot of stuff very early in the game or even later in the game. So it kind of has the flexibility of going all in on turn, you know, before three, even four, um, or to be able to have, a, I don't want to say a late game um, plan, but it has a, you know, a, a game past turn six or seven on like Pirate Warrior and things like that. Normally those decks kind of fizzle out. So same old Miracle Rogue we're used to. And um, what's interesting though, I'll actually add on top of this. Um, this deck does extremely well against Pirate Warrior. So the rise of Rogue means that you're going to be able to counter the Pirate Warrior. But the problem with Rogue um, is that it's... it's um, How do I explain this? It's weak to other decks such as like the Control Warrior, which has actually been springing up quite a bit. Um, I think Dragon Priest does fairly well against it. And I also think that any Reno deck performs fairly well uh, against this particular deck if they don't get some crazy turn that's going to blow them out, right? Because you can deal, you know, 20 plus damage with this deck with blood or uh, Cold Bloods and Leroy Jenkins and things of that nature. So it all depends kind of what you're going against, but I found this deck to be extremely well... Uh, do extremely well versus the pirate warrior sorry for some reason i had a little time a little hard time speaking about that all right so the next one is going to be just the pirate or i should say minion based kind of tempo roguish um i didn't include my random rogue because i figured this deck list kind of hits the nail on the head um with the deck pretty pretty close has a lot of the core parts of it which is basically summon a bunch of low cost minions swarm the board deal a sizable amount of damage and then burst them down whether through leroy cold bloods if this is deadly poisons whatever the case may be <laughs> um so this deck has an extremely easy time at curving out with creatures allowing you to make efficient efficient trades um you basically can keep the gas rolling with cards like the swash burglar and the Undercity Huckster, along with the Defender of Argus, surprisingly, because you're able to buff up your cards and make trades, um, which is quite nice. So, with this deck, very minion-oriented, going for the board, and um, basically an aggro deck. But it also, it's... Eh. I don't want to call it the Pirate Rogue, because it doesn't have quite as many pirates as the Pirate Warrior. 
um because it does have the ability to of course van cleef the under city huckster the vice ringleader so i would just call it like a, 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 a eh, an aggro aggro rogue it's hard to classify this deck though it's very close to my random rogue though all right, so our next one, oh gosh, what do we would we mess up? There it is. <laughs> um, it's going to be the shamans, and the first one we're going to talk about is the evolved shaman. So this is actually a very interesting list. Hold on, guys. <sighs> okay, it's the evolved shaman, which has actually sprung up quite a bit in the shaman lists. Uh, I wouldn't say it's the most popular shaman right now, but I would definitely say it's a shaman deck you need to keep an eye out for because if you don't realize what your opponent's doing um, kind of early on, a lot of these decks run one or two bloodlust. So if you get them, if you, they, you allow them to have a field full of totems and they play like one additional creature, they bloodlust, they can actually burst you out pretty, qu or pretty quick. Uh, but the core of this deck is to be able to evolve um, cards such as the doppelganger, the thing from below, their water speaker, even their totems. Um, so you got to watch out for that. It has the ability to have early game with Tunnel Trog and um, the Spirit Claws along with the Feral Spirits, just like the normal aggro to mid-range Shaman. But it's late game or mid or mid game, I should say, consists of, of course, the doppelganger and evolving those to make uh, basically three six drops, um, which is the core of this deck. It also runs Devolve, which which is really interesting so normally shaman is very weak to rogue because of the fact that they have conceal or they summon like a giant van cleave and eh, it's more so most i would have to say mostly just conceal so they play gadgets and auctioneer or they play a giant van cleave they conceal it the shaman can't do anything about it they attack with it they conceal it again and the game's over right so if you have or you play against another shaman they have a four drop seven seven you don't happen to draw hex things happen um so the devolve is in there and devolve says you don't actually have to target the creature it's just going to reduce all of the creatures on your opponent's side of the field uh, by one mana cost randomly and giving them a random creature so if they end up making like a big edwin make them like a 12 12 and conceal them you devolve and it makes them just a random two drop which you're probably going to be pretty satisfied with because it's most likely not going to be a 12 12 <laughs> uh two drop so that's why this deck is actually seeing a lot of uh a lot of popularity and a lot of increased play lately due to cool moves like that and also the deck's pretty fun overall uh, for those of you who are getting tired of the standard mid-range or aggro shaman the next one's going to be the jade golem shaman my personal favorite of shaman um it reminds me a lot of uh like a mid-rangey control deck you've got the early game um but not pirate early game thank god no patches or uh buccaneer in this list um just the standard tunnel trog lightning bolts blood mage uh you actually have of course the jade claws and the totem golem um so your mid range then flows right into the brand with the jade lightnings and the jade spirits of course you've got azure drake for draw with the mana tide and then you get to pump out cards like wide eyes which is a ton of value most of the time in the early game if you don't get you know your tunnel trog and your totem golem you're going to be hero powering a lot which makes thing from below really powerful uh the weakness in this deck is aggro because you don't have essentially a really strong early game your early game is okay but if you don't draw it you're kind of behind the curve if you're playing against another fast paced deck that is going to have an early game so that's why i've included the jade chieftains and the thing from blows is because you have to make up for not having an early game and taking a large quantity of damage somehow so whether we put in a water speaker for heal or we put in a taunt it's basically the same thing because you're absorbing damage and forcing your opponent to make trades maybe they normally wouldn't have to make um so you the taunts and the heals are interchangeable i prefer the thing from below because the heal is you can only heal yourself while the thing from below is actually a creature you can play and it can either soak damage for you or deal damage itself it's not solely just a heal um so that's kind of how i looked at it and of course it has the eye of black paul basically the, the the core of the jade golem package and um i've chosen to play uh, run the list like this of course you can change it as you like or add or take away how whatever you think but uh, this deck list has been pretty good for me so far and again jade golems is the way you win just solely outvalue your opponent get a huge board and they can't deal with it the next one's going to be the aggro shaman of course including in here is the pirate package early game along with the um, the ability to have the jade golem package in here but keep in mind with having the pirates and the four drop seven seven and then of course the lava burst and all of the direct face damage through spells you lose out on the jade golem so some of you may asking like why would you play jade golem shaman when you could just run aggro shaman and still be able to have the jade golem package in there and uh, the reason is with the jade golem shaman you're going to be able to get your jade golems 
to like 10 10 11 11 12 12 even more than that if you're able to brand some of them out um while the maximum value out of jade golems you're going to get from aggro shaman is a 6 6 because you only have six cards in the deck that summon jade golems including aya um and even when she dies it's including six so that's the max you're ever going to get with this deck if you draw all your jade is just 6 6 that's the highest they're ever going to get while with jade golem shaman it can go double that easy um, but the plus side of this deck is it's much quicker. It's got cards like Lava Burst and the Flame, flame Wreath Faceless, which allows you to push large, large quantities of damage exceedingly quick. Um, and you still, of course, have the Jade Golem package along with even the Pirate package in here and exceptional, except, <laughs> exceptional, making up words here. Uh, really nice early game weapons, such as the Spirit Claws and the um, Jade Claws. So the next one's going to be Midrange Shaman. Um, so this takes basically out the Jade Golem package and puts in high value creatures such as the Thunder Bluff, the Thing from Below, and things of that nature. So you're just kind of replacing one package with another package. Uh, Thunder Bluff has proven to be a very powerful card. Um, you can replace the Thing from Below or even the Water Speakers with maybe a Rag or an Alakir. There's many ways to build Midrange Shaman. This is just how I've chosen to build mine. I found that putting Rag and Alakir in the deck slows it down substantially, uh, which makes it lose a lot more against aggro, which I've seen the latter be more and more filled of as we move towards the later end of the season because more players are trying to rank up exceedingly quick and instead of taking their time in the early uh, phases of the month. So it always depends what the meta is looking like. Sometimes it's more control meta. You can take out the water speakers, throw in a couple more late game cards. As for when it gets a little bit more hyper aggressive, you take out those late game cards and you put in more heal and a three, six is always nice. Uh, so that's kind of the difference in between all the shaman lists at the moment. So the next one's going to be warlock, the class cool little picture there. I found it. Yeah, that's me. Um, it's going to be the Reno Warlock. Um, the deck hasn't changed a whole bunch over time. Whether you want to play, of course, the Blast Crystal Potion or the Fellfire Potion are kind of optional. Uh, I like the Blast Crystal Potion because if, let's say, you're playing against a Shaman and they're pretty popular right now and they play that 4-drop 7-7, seven, seven, if you don't have anything on board and you don't have a Siphon Soul ready to go... Um, you're just gonna lose. So I found that the um, the Blast Crystal Potion greatly helps your win rate for Shaman, um, and it's just a good card overall in my opinion. And um, besides that, in the Fellfire Potion, it's not much different than what you're normally gonna see. I've also chosen to forego running the combo of Leroy Jen Jenkins, Faceless Manipulator, and Power or uh, the Power Overwhelming's in here, but I've chosen not to include that particular combo. Um, you can add it in there if you want. It's just the play style of the deck just gets a little bit different. Don't think the core of it's gone. The core of it is running one of every card, Kazakus and Reno. That's what that's that's why people play this deck, not for the combo. All right, you could, I guess you could play for the combo, but the main points is Reno and Kazakus. <laughs> um, very slow, very controly deck, but like I mentioned before, with the difference in between the Warlock and the Reno Mage, is the Reno Mage is very reactive, and it has a lot of spells to deal with the creatures, while the Warlock has the ability to not only draw a ton of cards, and to be able to kind of keep drawing into stuff that you potentially will need, um, it also has the ability to play some pretty high-value minions, such as the Twilight Drake, um, the Abyssal Enforcer, the Mountain Giants, and um, of course Sylvanas, Emperor. There's just a ton of cards in this deck that if left unchecked will win you the game. So it's just a very different kind of Reno deck that still runs Reno, but feels a lot different than the Mage. Uh, which is really cool that you can have two decks that revolve around you know the Reno Jack and Jackson and Kazakus, but still feel very, very different from one another. So the next one we're going to look at is going to be Warrior, and I see that I forgot to get a uh, list, so we're going to cut it right here. Alright, sorry about that guys. The first Warrior deck we're going to talk about is going to be the Control Warrior. Um, not the strongest of decks right now, but a deck you are going to run into every now and again, and it's good to know kind of what the Control Warrior deck currently looks like, because it does fluctuate from time to time. Again, this is my particular build, um, but what the us Control Warriors have done, being this is my, one of my favorite decks to play, um, we, we've gotten a bit smart. We know we lose most of the time versus the Reno and the Kazakus, and there's just no outvaluing a double 10 mana potion. So... Our game plan is to be able to add two dirty rats to the deck, 
And we know when you're going to play Kazakus because you know at some point it's going to be you're playing against a control warrior. Um, you're going to want to brand into Kazakus for the double 10 mana. So you're going to hold particular cards in your hand for quite some time. Then we're going to be able to basically double dirty red in the same turn to get maximized value of maybe pulling a brand or Kazakus or a Reno. Uh, most of the time we're looking for either brand or Kazakus and... Um, that's kind of our win condition versus those particular decks, plus uh, being able to Dirty Rat into, of course, the um, Brawl is always extremely nice. Um, so that's kind of why this deck does a little bit better than it would if Dirty Rat wasn't a thing. If Dirty Rat wasn't here, there'd be no way for us to stop the Bran into the Double Kazakas, other than maybe being able to tempo out and have like Ally Armor Smith with a Taskmaster or something like that stick to the board. Uh, but besides that, this deck is very controlling. The uh, this deck aims to have your opponent run out of steam, get them completely out of resources, and then from there be able to win with maybe a Hell Scream, the Ysera, um, the Ally Armor Smith, the Elise Star Seeker of course just being able to out survive fatigue uh, which happens a lot of the time with it being control warrior so with that said there's not too much to say about control warrior the deck's been around for a very long time currently it's not in the best position i would hope it to be in um, but maybe after this rotation of cards and the new expansion comes out it might see light again but it's still a pretty popular deck at that and i've seen a lot of control warriors running out there um, taking a lot of decks by surprise because um whether a deck is like the best or not doesn't really matter if your opponent mulligans for you to be an aggro deck and you're a control deck they could you know they can mess themselves up so you'll actually find yourselves if you play kind of an off curve deck a lot of times you'll be able to take your opponent by surprise the next deck is going to be the minion based pirate warrior um so when this deck first came out, or I shouldn't say first came out, but when it first took Rise as being a very popular, very powerful deck at the beginning of the Mean Streets expansion, a lot of players are running, um, of course, the, uh, now I'm losing it, the Heroic Strikes and the uh, Mortal Strike, which are spell-based damage and be able to pump out a huge amount of burst in one turn. Uh, but now a lot of people are running the, you know, the cheap C or the cheap field removals and or just mulliganing in the mulligan phase. As soon as they play against Warrior, they're keeping Hellfire, they're keeping Demon Wrath, they're keeping Blizzard, um, they're keeping, of course, all of their cards to be able to deal with the board. Um, and to kind of stop the damage. So with that said, uh, the Pirate Warriors, you guys, have gotten a lot smarter. You said, well, you know, if you're going to keep clearing my board, I'm going to play a more value-oriented or, or, uh, more value -oriented game. And we're going to have a little bit more powerful minions and make them a little bit more difficult to deal with. So you've added the South Sea Captain. You've added the Naga Corsair. You've gone ahead and even added the Captain Greenskin and Sky Captain Crab, uh, Crag, like my deck here. And you've taken out the Leroy. Uh, the Crag is just kind of a tech in. I actually like him a lot more than Leroy, in my personal opinion. And the Captain Greenskin comes in super clutch because you don't need a pirate down to give your um, Arcanine Reaper that plus one, plus one upgrade. And upgrade is what makes this deck so powerful because your weapons are allow you to trade into other creatures for basically free at the sacrifice of health. But your opponent's not worried about your health in the early game because they have to deal with all your creatures. So I think this minion-based... Um, aggro pirate warrior has a lot more potential and can do much much better than the normal just heroic strike mortal strike throw up on the board if your opponent clears it you lose like if you're like this deck can win even if your opponent reno jackson's because most of the time your field is going to have you know five fours the naga corsair so good you 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 throw down the Nazoth, like normally you throw down Nazoth first mate you never really upgrade that you you do if you have to but you normally upgrade your you know your war axes or your reapers but you could actually not a corsair your nazos first mate make the weapon a two four and you never even used an upgrade so you automatically turned your one four or your one three i'm sorry your one three weapon into a two three weapon making it deal six damage instead of just three and in the cards of five uh, four to begin with so sorry about that didn't mean to say one four this is not lights justice or would it not lights just i don't know whatever the paladin one is it might be lights justice i'm pretty sure it's light justice anyway um the minion based aggro pirate warrior is kind of the new structure of of pirates uh in the warrior class that is it, it has the ability to basically uh, i don't want to say outvalue but it can continuously pump out the important cards and still do large quantities of damage extremely extremely quick quick oh man this video is long okay our last deck very good deck and an interesting deck the dragon 
Temple Warrior. So originally this deck started off, if you saw the deck guide on it, I don't know if it's released yet, but if you saw the deck guide, I went over this deck quite thoroughly. Um, this deck originally began as just the Tempo Warrior. Um, from there, the deck turned into Dragon Tempo Warrior, and then it kind of was like a super dominant deck. Everybody played it super powerful, and then it kind of died out, and then Shaman came, Supreme Leader, Master Race, Destroy All, everything else. Then, the Pirate Package came out, <laughs> and then people said, well, Pirates and Warrior is good. Temple Warrior is pretty good. Why don't I just make Dragon Pirate Temple Warrior? <laughs> uh, and this is what we have. So it has the early game of Pirates. It has the middle game of just Tempo Warrior. It has the later game, or I should say mid to late game, of Dragons. It's very interesting, super cool. Um, deck does a ton of work, had a bunch of fun with it. And um, just every turn, you're playing a very high priority minion that, if you're again, your opponent doesn't kill, you're going to be able to win the game. Um, these cards are Frothing Berserker. Of course, they don't deal with the small time Buccaneer. Um, taking three damage on a turn one card is extremely bad for your opponent. Blackwing Corruptor, deal three damage. It's a 5 4. Um, you have the Crusher. They don't kill that. It's a 9 9 if your opponent has less than 15 life, which by turn six. If you've been able to play your Alex Straza's champion, your small time buccaneer, your fierce monkey, your frothing, your elite, your guardian, your azure, like there's just tons of stuff that does damage prior to turn six. Then you play a nine nine, your opponent uses CC on that, you drop curator, all of a sudden you're drawing two or three cards, you drop Hellscream, Deathwing, and your opponent just explodes. They're just done. They can't take all of the high priority cards. So with that said, um, definitely different than Pirate Warrior, definitely different than Drew, uh, Control Warrior, so this is like a mix. We got like super aggro with the Pirates, we've got the middle, which is this deck, and then we've got of course the Control Warrior over to our right. So we got a good broad spectrum of early to control with the Warrior class right now, which I think is important. All of the decks are viable, all of them are good, and um, uh, that's very, very cool for a class to see, you know, the range of being able to play fast paced and control decks and all of them have a pretty decent win rate overall. Um, so with that said, we have not included the Hunter class again due to the fact that the deck, the class right now is just not strong. It's not a popular class. You're not going to see a whole lot of Hunter. So we've actually excluded that particular uh, archetype and class from our monthly meta. So with that said, hopefully you've enjoyed. I know I kind of uh, uh, fumbled on a few parts there, but with this vi video being so long, and normally I don't break it up. It's just one chunk. I don't like to add cut things and piece them together that doesn't seem real right like i want to keep this the highest quality content possible give you it all in one shot and i do my best to of course um, bring that to you so with that said hopefully you've enjoyed let me know what you think what you thought and if i excluded and messed up on anything or left anything out feel free to leave that in the comment section below for everybody looking to get a little bit more information that i might have again left out or just didn't have time to cover uh, you can leave those in of course the comment section below so with that said thanks for stopping by i'll see you next Next month for the monthly meta. Until then, I'll catch you in the next video. Of course, I'm Morshak and happy whatever the hell day it is.